So as we talked about at the beginning, we have a few important links today. Uh, we have the workshop website where all of this is going to be linked. Uh, we also have the command history web page. That is a little thing you can throw in your browser. It will tell you where I have recently typed within 10 seconds. Uh, it's currently not going to be running until I sign into Crane as well. We'll do that probably in about 20 minutes. We also have our documentation, which is a great resource both during and after the workshop, as well as, as our job examples. Those are a great place to help you get started on how to get your own workflow on Crane. And then finally, we have the slide deck today. So if you want to either have that pulled up, that is linked on our workshop webpage, or you can go and refer to it in the future. Our agenda for today is going to be introducing high performance computing, talking about what a supercomputing cluster is going to be, who is the Han Computing Center and what services we provide on a broader scale, as well as using the Slurm job scheduler to submit interactive and batch jobs. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to get more on the focus of data storage, transferring files, and using system applications on our supercomputers. Uh, that's going to take a lot more time than it will today, so we'll move that off to tomorrow. Okay, let's also go ahead and clear these reactions here. Uh, and so to kind of just introduce it off, high-performance computing is basically referring to the practice of aggregating computing power in a way that delivers much higher performance than one could have a typical desktop or workstation to solve very large problems in science, engineering, and business. Uh, this, there's a lot more fields nowadays that are introducing high performance computing, especially with humanities and economics. Those are two big ones coming around. Uh, some other common ones that you see are with state COVID research as well. That would fall under science, but this is kind of just a quick summary of what it is. Uh, a lot of the times we, and we have new people come to us, it's my workflow takes too long on my desktop or my desktop doesn't have the resources. And so being able to export that workflow to a much larger computer or a set of computers is able to help take that time from days or weeks or even months down to something much more manageable and something much more practical for research, much more practical for our publications. And it's a great resource overall. Uh, a compute cluster on a more technical diagram, and this is how all of our clusters are laid out, is that they have four key components. Uh, what we've interacted with so far for the past two days and what we'll be interacting with a little more today has been the login node. This is a singular or multiple computer set for users to interact with directly. It's going to be the one where you first log in. It's where you can manage some files at a basic level. It's where you can see what's happening on the cluster. Uh, in order for you to be able to see what's on the cluster and what's happening, a node or a computer is needed to manage it or the management node down here. We also need to store our files. And so we've talked about briefly of how Crane has a very large file system of over a thousand terabytes. Uh, that is handled on a storage array that's separate from each of the individual computers. That way, if one of the computers or the login node has a little hissy fit, not the data doesn't go away, it's still somewhere else. It also helps ensure that we have a higher speed file system. And then finally, the big power behind the cluster and supercomputer are the worker nodes. So for example, Crane has about 572 worker nodes, which is a lot more computers than we probably have as a group here in this Zoom session. Uh, that's where that aggregation of computing power comes from. It allows us to take that raw performance from those computers and be able to apply it to your workflow. These are some examples of different clusters that we've had at the Han Computing Center in the past. Just as a fun little question, does anyone recognize these down in the bottom right-hand corner? Feel free to speak up or throw it in chat. That is correct, these are Raspberry Pis. So in the past, we've taught a cluster computing class, I would say probably three or four years ago. And a quiet and effective way to teach that is rather than bringing in giant servers from an old cluster, 
it's easy enough to bring in five little small Raspberry Pis, network those together to help teach the concepts of cluster computing. Uh, we also had a former cluster called a bug eater. And so these are, this was a cluster of about eight old desktops that were managed just by those two terminals right there. Could still connect to them remotely, I believe. However, this is a very small cluster. <laughs> and then we also have a cluster that's still running, which is red. This currently lives in the basement of the Shore Center on UNL's campus under the stadium. And it's a cluster used for the Large Hadron Collider project in Switzerland. Uh, it's not one of the two general use clusters that we have. It's dedicated pretty much exclusively to that project. Um, its name is based off of both us being Nebraska, but it's also nice that we have these red LEDs in there, make it look a little fancy as well. Uh, Crane and Rhino look fairly similar as well. Uh, Crane lives up in Omaha, while Rhino lives here at UNL at the Walter Scott uh, Engineering Complex. Talking about the fun numbers and technical specifications of everything briefly, uh, the three resources we have primarily is Rhino. It's 110 computers with 64 cores and a lot of memory per computer. Uh, it has about 360 terabytes of shared storage. Crane is the shiny and newest cluster that we have with about rounding up to 600 new uh, nodes. Uh, has a few less cores, but they're faster cores than Rhino. Uh, about 64 gigabytes per node of memory. So each computer has 64 gigabytes compared to Rhino's 256. We do have some nodes that have 256, 512, or one and a half terabytes of memory. Crane also has about one and a half petabytes or 1,500 terabytes of storage. So it's a very large cluster overall. And then we also briefly talked about RED, which is used to analyze and store data from the CMS detector in Switzerland with the Large Hadron Project. Overall, we have about 30,000 cores as a computing center with about 15 petabytes or 15,000 terabytes of storage with 64 to one and a half or 64 gigabytes to one and a half terabytes of memory per node. And then more recently, we've been getting a lot more involved with GPUs. Uh, those have been a great resource for accelerating a variety of research. Uh, we have, I believe, about, I want to say 140 GPUs roughly as a department. Uh, these are been a big success with researchers and a great tool overall. In addition to that, we also have Anvil. This is basically Holland Computing Center's private cloud using the OpenStack framework. It provides customizable virtual machines, very similar to say Amazon's EC2 or Microsoft Azure, uh, except it's something we host on site. This is a great resource for projects not best served on a computing environment like Crane or Rhino, where say you need an interactive desktop environment or an alternate operating system like Windows 10 or Windows uh, 8, uh, upcoming Windows 11 as well. Uh, maybe you need to do some databases that are constantly static. So if your jobs on Crane need to connect to a database to store data or to access data that's not gonna be deleted at the end of the day. That's a great option. Uh, if you're doing projects that require root access or need to access the kernel or modify it, then that's another option. Or if you want to do some test cluster environments or do test some concepts that you could not traditionally test on Crane or Rhino, this is a great option as well. Uh, to get access to it, it's pretty much you send us a paragraph or two of why you need access to Anvil, and then you'll get a small uh, set of resources available, about 10 virtual machines and 20 cores worth of resources. Uh, if you need more than that, pretty much send us another set of explanation of why you need more resources. That starts off as free. Uh, if you need even more resources after that, there is a small priority access charge for that that is available on our website. Uh, we also have Attic, which is a nearline data archive that we offer. This is backed up in both Lincoln and Omaha for disaster tolerance. So if something happens up in Omaha, it doesn't exist anymore, or just the networking goes down, 
the data is backed up here in Lincoln or vice versa. If something happens here in Lincoln, like the basement floods, then there's a copy up in Omaha. There's a 10 gigabit per second transfer speed to and from the clusters when using the Globus Connect interface. Uh, we'll probably talk about this a little more tomorrow with data transferring as well. There is a charge to this of about $26 per terabyte per year. So while it's not free, it's certainly much cheaper than a lot of commercial cloud services. And more recently, a lot of uh, researchers and individuals have been using Attic as the sole reason for using HCC to help store a lot of their old research data or new research data coming in. It's a great resource for that. Uh, other things that we provide as a uh, computing center is free shared resources to all and new students, staff, faculty, and researchers, as well as those who are collaborating with those students, staff, and faculty. We also provide dedicated resources maintained by uh, HC, our system administrators here at HCC. And then one of my favorite ones is the educational services through hands-on workshops like this, or group or classroom tutorials like we did last week for a class over on Innovation Campus. We also provide consultation with research computing experts to help get your research from ground to zero, all the way up to running very fast on Crane. We also provide extended computing resources through the Open Science Grid, or OSG, which is now, I believe, 146 sites across North America. This is a great resource if you need to submit a whole bunch of small little things and submit them across a large scale. And Exceed is kind of the flip side of that, where if you need have a very big job or have a lot of very big jobs and you need more resources than we can provide, we can work with Exceed to help get that bridged out to other computing centers to help fulfill your research. Uh, some of the research that we've helped with, uh, it's been a lot of the science or the humanities, uh, some digital literacy as well, such as what makes a book a bestseller. We've helped with things like what makes a gravitational or the big gravitational wave discovery back in, let's say, 2017, that was. Uh, we also, if you've been around with UNL for a while or have looked at the news, the big dorm collapse that we had in 2017, uh, just because it was time to get rid of it. Uh, the simulations for that demolition were ran on crane that the sensor data from the demolition to help make sure that it collapsed inwards. We took sensor data from that and then that was compared against the simulations from before the demolition. Uh, the results were very close to the simulation, so that's a great sign. Nothing went horribly wrong. So we've had a whole lot of variety of research done here as a center. Uh, before we move on, do we have any questions? If we are good to go. Can you throw up a green check mark for me? That was kind of a lot of information there in a fairly quick fashion. Thank you. I'm going to move this down so I can see. So, running jobs on the clusters, uh, all software and analyses must be done on the worker nodes. Uh, if you start anything big on the login node, it will be killed. Ideally, you keep tasks on the login node to be something brief or something small. <clears throat> so if you're going to be managing some files or editing some text or doing a very small data transfer, the login node is great for that. But if you are going to be compressing a large data set or, or extracting a large data set or trying to do a simulation, uh, it's best to make that into a job on the cluster and submit that out. Uh, we'll talk about how to do this here shortly and we'll do some hands-on practice with this. It's also a good idea to think of everything on the cluster as a job. So if you want to do an action, make it a job. If you want to do something big, make it a job. <laughs> uh, we do jobs and manage these through something called Slurm or the simple Linux utility for resource management. This is an open source and scalable cluster management system that has been developed over, I think, the last 20 years or so. It's used at about 60% of the top 500 supercomputers. Uh, so it's a very big tool, it's very popular. And jobs with a lot of centers, including us, are based on user priority. 
And the way we manage this is through something called a fair share, where if you're a new user, you haven't really used the cluster much, you have a higher priority than someone who uses the maximum amount of resources that you can use at one time. So if you submit a few jobs, your priority will go down slightly. If you wait a little bit, it'll go back up. If you submit a whole bunch of jobs or a whole bunch of big jobs and they go for a whole week, then it's going to decrease your priority even more. This is just to help make sure things are fair on the cluster, make sure that new researchers or new users such as yourselves will be able to use the cluster. And when we have big researchers who are using 2000 cores at once. The way this works for submitting jobs though, is you basically define a set of tasks that you want to have completed. You write this down for the cluster. You submit it to the job queue or basically the line. If you have a little fast pass or higher priority, your job will go ahead of others in the queue. This is submitted out to the slurm management system where once there's some time or some space for your job to be completed, it then gets executed on the worker nodes. It churns out for a few seconds to a few days, depending on how big your job is. And then the results are sent back to you and life goes on. Uh, there's two types of jobs that we will talk about. Uh, the first type we'll talk about are batch jobs, which are going to be writing those set of instructions down for the cluster. These scripts will contain different commands or different parameters for your job. And it basically says, I want how many resources, what needs done, and then where would you like the output? This uses a command called sbatch. We also have interactive jobs, which are a great way to be able to test different simulations or test small pieces of code or do something that is better served from being able to interact with your job manually. And so say if you're transferring files or if you're submitting or extracting the files or transferring data and it's something fairly short rather than running it on the login node you can create a short interactive job which gets sent out to one of the worker nodes you'll have a little terminal in your uh, window and you can use that to manually do things instead these are basically done through longer command it's once you get resources are allocated uh, basically whatever you type just like on the login node and what we've been doing the last few days you can do that manually yourself uh, once you've run out of the time you've requested with the interactive job or even with batch jobs uh, you have a 32 second warning pass when the time expires and then the job is killed uh, this is done just so that way your job doesn't go on forever it doesn't tell the cluster to stop uh, typically, the most we allow you to request is about seven days or 168 hours. Uh, you can certainly request much less than that, and it's encouraged to. And that way, it's easier to fit your job into the cluster. It's easier to find a small hole in something to fit a job into than it is to find a big hole in a job. Uh, batch jobs. There's a thing set of steps we'll do here in a second. Uh, basically, you make a little submit script like we did yesterday, or similar to what we did yesterday, where you specify seven instructions, you tell it what uh, resource information you need, all the commands to run your job. If those resources that you specified are exceeded, whether it be memory or time, your job will be killed just so that way it doesn't interfere with anyone else. Uh, these are added to the queue using sbatch. SQ will show you your running jobs and S account will show the information about completed jobs or pending or submitted jobs. Uh, all of this we'll talk about here in a second and we'll practice this a little bit as well. Uh, but to kind of break things down, we have a example submit script here. And breaking it down, we've taken the output of a submit file called invert single dot slurm. We start off at the very top and we have something called a shebang, which tells a slurm what kind of script it is. And so a pound sign with an exclamation point slash bin slash sh tells the slurm scheduler to use the bash interpreter for this. Down here in this section where it's all preceded by a pound symbol on sbatch, 
we have the different uh, resource requests that we are making. So here we have the time request of zero hours and 10 minutes and zero seconds. So if your job will say go past that 10 minute mark, it will be killed just to prevent it from overrunning. Down below that, we are requesting one computer or one node. On that node, or for how many nodes we're requesting, we are asking for one core or one end task. For the entire job, we are requesting 10 gigabytes of memory. This, you can basically say 10G or 10,000M for 10,000 megabytes. We can also request how much memory we would like per CPU or end task. So one end task times 10 gigabytes per CPU. It'll also get you 10 gigabytes of memory. Uh, either of these options will work. A job name, that's basically what your job will be called to the scheduler and to yourself. Uh, this is something that would be beneficial to name something unique or have automatically made it unique. This way, if you're troubleshooting something or trying to figure out what's been done and what hasn't, you can easily refer to that job name and figure out what's happening. And then finally, the last two that we'll talk about with this example are the dash dash error. This is where any of the errors or anything sent to standard out will be printed out into a file. By default, this goes to something labeled as slurm dash the job ID dot err. Uh, if you say otherwise, it'll go to what you specified. And very similarly, you have dash dash output. This is where all the output from your job should go or where standard out is redirected. And just like the error file from earlier, if you don't specify anything, it'll be put into a file called slurm with your job ID instead. Going down even farther, this is where the nitty gritty of your job is actually processed. This is where you specify the instructions to do your job itself. And so going down the line again, we have module load MATLAB. Uh, as a brief introduction to it, we use a system called module to manage all, I think 1300 different software packages we have as a center. Uh, we're gonna talk about that more tomorrow in the second half of the lesson, uh, but this is just how you load software. We then navigate to our work directory to the MATLAB tutorial folder we then make a directory in slash TMP or slash temp using a variable, and we'll talk about this shortly, for the Slurm job ID. So if it's going to create a directory with this job ID. So if our job ID was 123456, that will make a directory called slash temp slash 123456. And that's just a great way if you're managing a whole bunch of files or if you're doing say a temporary directory. It helps keep things organized. And then finally, we call the final command or the execution of our actual code, where we tell MATLAB to execute the invert random script. Uh, before we move on, are there any questions? Now, if you have a question, throw up a red X. If you're good to go, give me a green check. If I request 32 cores with one node, am I supposed to assign a node N1, or can another job use the remaining cores of the node one? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, basically, Slim knows how many resources each node has. So for example, let's take one of the largest Cray nodes we have of 36 cores. If you request a 32 core job, then there will be still be those four cores available for someone else to use. So if someone has a four core job, they can put that on the note, same node. Or if someone has four one core jobs, they can fit it on that. So it allows us to get the most out of all the computers that we have available. Uh, if you request all of the memory on one node with those 32 cores, then that will basically have the entire node dedicated to you. Uh, similarly, with other resources on the node, it depends on how much you take as a percentage. And some is, uh, 
Yeah, so basically Serm is designed to run a, a shell script and then the shell script is what executes your actual code. Uh, yeah, Richika, in this case, there is they pretty much are being used interchangeably. Uh, I should probably get away from saying CPU and cores as a similar thing. Uh, but yes, in this case, they are. Sure. Okay, so let's go ahead and clear feedback and continue on. Uh, so some other option or some of the options we just talked about, uh, the kind of the more complex or the more interesting ones are going to be your time. So Slurm will use a this format where you specify the days, then a hyphen, the number of hours, then minutes and seconds. Uh, my personal preference is just to use the number of hours. So if you want seven days of time, it's 168 hours. If you want two days of time, you can request 48 hours. Uh, either way is fine. On the primary partition for Crane, it's going to basically be seven days is the maximum time you can run. Uh, again, the less time you request, the sooner your job will be started. It's just easier to fit a small job into the cluster than it is for a large one. Uh, for asking for memory, both in terms of dash dash mem or mem per CPU, you can request it using any sound format. And so say, if you want 512 gigabytes of memory on Crane, you can say 512G. Uh, you could also say 512,000M or 512 of million K. Uh, I'd probably say use G just to help keep things clean. Uh, is end tasks provided as an environment variable? Uh, it is. So I think we have that on another slide. Uh, if we don't, I will get that to you during one of our exercises. And audio, I believe, should be working here. Using NTAS as an environment variable, that's a great option. And so if you have, say, uh, a Python script or an R script that will take the number of cores as an argument for, say, a for loop, you can certainly pass that to the script or use it within the script to help modify it dynamically. Uh, in terms of the big question of how much should we request, uh, short answer is we don't know. The longer answer is it's highly dependent on your application, your data set, the parameters you select. Uh, some good starting points is if you've ran your simulation or your workflow on your laptop or desktop, you can request the same specs that your laptop or desktop has. So for example, I have a four core laptop with 16 gigabytes of memory. I can request that as a good starting point, maybe a few extra gigabytes or a few extra cores here or there. Uh, you can talk with someone else who's used the software before, or if there's a recommended amount of resources that the software has to use, you can start with that. And then something else we can do as well for figuring out how much you need is, again, trial and error. So you can throw it, say, four cores, 16 gigabytes of memory, see how that goes. You can check the utilization of what the job did. So if you found out that it was constantly using all four cores that you asked for, but very little memory, you can adjust your script to say, oh, give me eight cores now with half the memory. Uh, you can also just kind of anchor with the settings to figure out what works best for your workflow. Uh, something to note is that if you throw 100 cores at a solution rather than two cores, you're not going to get a 50 times performance or speed increase. At some point, it's going to level off of how efficient the program and job will be. And that's entirely dependent on the application you're running. Uh, some additional options you can define is let's say you need a job to finish or start by no sooner than a certain time. You can pass that to your SERM script. Uh, if it's no longer going to be valid to have a job run, if say you need have a deadline of Friday and after that it's pointless to run the job because you've missed a deadline, 
you can specify that as well. You can also manually hold a job itself. So if you just add dash dash hold to your script, it, the Slurm scheduler will hold that job in place until you tell it to do otherwise using S control release and then the job ID. You can also say, don't bother putting this in queue. If you can't start it right now, then don't bother submitting at all. Something that a lot of researchers also like to use is the dash dash mail type and dash dash mail user, which is, allows you to uh, basically get an email whenever the job starts, ends, fails, hits its time limit, or gets to a certain point in its time limit. This way you can say, four o'clock on a Thursday, I'll go ahead and submit my job. I'd like to know when it finishes on Friday so I can continue on with my research. It's kind of just a quick little notification without having to sign into the cluster. Uh, it, a little more detailed if you want the files to just append constantly to a single file. So you have a record of all of your errors in one spot. Uh, you can use dash dash open mode to append or truncate to that file. If you want to just make sure your script can run and there's no error with the submission part of it, uh, you can add tests only. And then if you need to specify how much temporary disk space or drive space that the job will need, uh, that's also an option. Uh, something to note is that all of our worker nodes have some scratch disk available on them. So for example, Rhino has a terabyte and a half on each worker node and Crane has four terabytes on each worker node. So already a very large space. Uh, the scratch space is a little faster than the work file system for the jobs themselves. But once the job is done, that scratch space is deleted. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, scrolling down to here, wherever we were. Okay. Uh, as that there's been talking in chat about environment variables, uh, these are things you can use within your script or within your application itself. So we've already seen using Slurm job ID or uh, Slurm task for nodes. <clears throat> these are great ways to help dynamically make or make your script more dynamic. So if you want your error file to include the job ID or the job name, that's an option. If you're running a piece of MPI code that will work across multiple computers, you can specify the number of nodes to help make that process a lot easier. You can also have it specify the number of end tasks or cores being used. So let's say you have a Python script and you want to parallelize your code and you need to specify how many cores the job has, then you can use that as an option. If you want to capture what the directory of submission was or your current working directory at the time, you have that available. And you also have some tasks per node, which is basically asking how many number of tasks you have per computer. So if you request 20 cores over two nodes, it will say 10. If you request 30 cores on one computer, it will say 30. Uh, again, these are a great option to be using overall. If you don't want to type those long and variables out in your job submission script itself, you can replace that with short symbols, such as the master job allocation number or the job ID itself. Uh, if you also have lowercase j as an option, if you're running a job array, you can use a lowercase a to say which index it's in. So if you say have a job array with 100 jobs, you can basically say, okay, Python script, load data file number one through 100, and you can use that as an argument for that. You can also pull in the node name as an option or your username. Uh, you also have before, some reason if you need to have the percent sign in your script, you'll have to add a second one in it just to cancel the other one out. 
You also have the option of padding your uh, environment variables. So say a job ID gets really long, it will truncate it out or it will keep it as short as it's possible. If you want it to be a constant format, so if you want zeros at the front, you can basically say percent sign, how many digits you'd like, and then the uh, symbol itself. If you have a long file, uh, job name, for example, you could do a percent sign with, I believe it's a lowercase n. I'm not too sure on that off the top of my head. And then say 70 if your job has a very long name. Those are some different options available. Uh, something we'll talk about, probably not this time around, our job arrays. These are a great resources if you're doing the same thing over a large set or something multiple times. So as I mentioned earlier, let's say you have a Python script to do an analysis on uh, 100 different data files, and it's the same analysis, and you have your files named input1.csv, input2.csv, et cetera. You can basically say, okay, Python jobs.py and then the job array ID as the input and your script then can submit that out and you then have a hundred jobs running for each one of those in, or one, one job for the hundred input files each. So you have a hundred jobs running. Uh, it's a nice, great way to make something embarrassing parallel if you can split things up, basically just reducing the amount of time by making tasks smaller. Uh, if you have a job dependency, for example, like a job needs to, can only start after another job has finished. So if you have, say, one job to process the data or gather the data, then the next job uh, cleans it, the next job processes it, and then another job makes a visualization. Uh, that's a great time to use dependencies. You basically say when to execute it or what job or if to submit a job if something doesn't complete successfully, that's an option as well. Uh, another useful command is scancel, which as the name kind of implies, it cancels something or it'll cancel the job based off of the job ID you give it. That's a default uh, argument you can give it. You can also cancel jobs by the name, uh, by a partition, by the, your user or the state, and so something to note here really quick is no one can cancel your jobs and you can't cancel other people's jobs. That's just to help prevent people from messing around with different jobs. So if, let's say you have job, our job one, two, three, four, five, six again, and you realize, oh no, I made a spelling error in this. You can go ahead and cancel that job while it's running, fix your error and resubmit it. Let's say you made that error across a whole plethora of 100 jobs. What you can do is you can say, okay, that's cancel dash dash user and then your username and I'll cancel all of your jobs. And let's say you want to cancel all of your running jobs. You can basically do the same thing, but with dash dash state and then running or going one step further, let's say you have running jobs on a the short partition so a partition we have for things being short you can basically specify that with a partition flag and the state flag so there's a whole book, bunch of different combinations you can do uh, going back to the uh, parameters real quick i noticed that in chat the uh, slim options were provided so that's a great option to be able to look at all the different customization you can do briefly now, moving on to the SQ itself. Uh, SQ is basically where you see what's happening on the cluster. This will show the job ID in one column, the partition that the job is running on or assigned to, the name of the job, who's running it or who owns the job, the state, how long it's been running, how many computers it's requested and what computers it's running on if it's running or why it hasn't started yet. Uh, kind of going in more detail, partitions are 
a way we divvy up the cluster into different sections. So batch is going to be the one you submit to by default. It has the majority of the resources assigned to it. Uh, we also have a partition for, say, a job that's small and it can be killed at any time. You just need it to run and take opportunity of free resources. That's called guess. There's also another partition called GPU. So if you want to use GPU resources, you have to submit it to that partition. Job name is fairly self-evident. Same with user. That's just what the job is called and who owns it. Uh, the state uses short codes. So if you see a R or a PD, that means it's still in queue and going. Uh, PD means it's pending and waiting resources or waiting for your priority to get to a certain point. Run means it's actively running. Uh, CG or yeah, CG basically means it's completing at that present point in time. And then it'll switch over to CD once it's done. Uh, typically, you won't see F or CA for canceled and failed in the queue just because those are taken out of the queue itself. Uh, number of nodes, also fairly self evident. That's how many nodes were requested or are currently being used. And then the node list is what computers the job is running on. And then the reasons or why a job hasn't finished. Uh, those are basically why your job hasn't started yet. The most common ones you'll see is priority. And this basically says, hey, your priority is fairly low right now. You've done a whole bunch of job submissions. Uh, other people have a higher priority than you. Uh, you may see resources, which, nope, that wasn't there. Uh, if you see resources, that basically says, hey, there's not enough free computers on the cluster right now or free enough resources to run your job. Uh, dependency, so this only applies if you have a job before that needs to finish in order for that job to run. Node or partition down basically means something broke or something is unavailable. Uh, something more recent that you may have Seen if you've poked around on the clusters is a requested node not available or the maintenance flag. And basically this just says there's nothing that we could actually run on or what you're trying to request isn't available. And this is commonly thrown when we're trying to do some maintenance on the cluster like we did last week. Or if some solar flare happens and Slurm says, oh, this computer doesn't exist anymore, then it'll just say that and it's a generic, nothing was found to run this on. Uh, some other, some common options for SQ to kind of narrow down some things is dash U, which is going to be the username you're looking for. So by default, SQ will show everything in the queue. So this can be from all 2,000 users using the cluster at one time. You'll probably get an output that's about 4,000 lines long. And you probably only want to look at what you have in the queue. You can also request a specific job or specific partitions or states. You can also specify how to start it or how to sort it, as well as when things are expected to start as an option. Um, there's some more documentation on everything you can ask from SQ available on Slurm's documentation page. Uh, we'll be playing with all this here in a bit, probably in the next 15, 20 minutes or less. Uh, you can also submit an interactive job to monitor your batch jobs using, basically you submit an interactive job, you specify the job ID itself to get what command or what job or node it, the job is running on, or you specifically request that same computer. You can then use a program called a top to view the CPU and memory usage of it. Uh, there's also a way to look at the memory usage and other parameters of a job by looking at a file on the node. Uh, if we have time, we might explore into this some later today. Uh, let's see what else. So we're going to go ahead and do a quick exercise right here. Uh, before I move on to this, are there any questions? Uh, 
Uh, SQ and S account doesn't provide available cores on each node. How can we get the available cores on each node or available cores in the cluster? That is a great question. So there's a command called S info. Uh, I'll type that into chat real quick. And basically that specifies the status of all of the current computers in the cluster in a condensed format by default. You will then be need to go in and specify a output format to show what each node has individually. Uh, I don't remember those options off the top of my head, but this link that I'm throwing into chat will have some of those options. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know that off the top of my head, but you can view that with S info. If you are ready to move on, go ahead and give me that green check in the box. If you have a question, uh, throw up a red X and mic up, please. Okay, so we have seven green X, or not green X's, <laughs> green check marks. Okay, we have a few more green check marks need to be thrown up. Uh, are there still any pending questions out there? Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and clear the feedback now. So we're gonna go ahead and sign into Crane here real quick. So I'm gonna pull up my terminal here. Uh, is this a good font size for everyone? Uh, if you need it bigger, give me a red X. If you if it's good for you, give me a green check. Okay, I'll make it a little bigger here. Actually, let me go ahead and make it like this. And let me actually share the terminal itself. There we go. So we are going to go ahead and sign into Crane. Uh, if you're already signed in, go ahead and give me a green check mark. Uh, just to kind of demo the process again for everyone. We will do from either your terminal on Mac and Linux or from the command prompt on Windows. Uh, if you're using Windows 7 or 8, you'll probably need to use a software called PuTTY. But we are going to go SSH, our username. I'm going to use the demo01 today at crane.unl.edu. Enter in your password. It will not show on the screen just to help keep things safe. I entered my password in wrong. You'll then select one or the appropriate option for Duo, and you'll get a notification on your phone. Let's go ahead and accept that. So here's kind of just a quick little output. It looks like everyone was able to successfully sign in for us. So ignore what I'm doing currently. This is just that way the command history will work. So let's go ahead and copy this. So if you'd like to follow along with your web browser as well, you can go to that link and it will basically be everything I type into the terminal from here on out. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear my terminal. And let's go ahead and clear feedback. So the first thing we are going to do is navigate to our work directory. So we're going to do that with CD and then a little shortcut that we have of dollar sign work. If we type print working directory, we can see that we are in slash work, slash our group, and then our username. What we will now need to do is get a set of job examples. So that's gonna be the link we sent earlier. 
We are going to clone that using git into our current directory. For that, we will do, whoops, I clicked on the wrong thing. We are going to do git clone https slash, slash github.com forward slash unl hcc slash job slash examples dot git. And what this does is it reach out, reaches out to GitHub to basically pull some files for us and put it into a folder. If you type ls, you should see that you have a job examples folder. We are going to go ahead and take this opportunity as a five minute break. So we'll get back at 11.05. Uh, once you have this job examples folder in your work directory, go ahead and give me a green check. If you have any issues, go ahead and throw up a red X and we will get some help with you. And thank you for posting that in the chat region. So go ahead and take a little stretch and get some coffee, get some water. We will return at 11.05. So if we go ahead and change our directory using CD job examples, we are going to move into the job examples directory. If we do PWD, we can still verify that we're in work, our group, user, and job examples. If we type LS, we can see the variety of different example jobs that we have available. So we have C, R, Blast, Fluent, Gromax, uh, Jupyter, MATLAB, Python, SAS, FASPS, a whole variety of different types of jobs available for testing. Uh, today we are going to play with MATLAB a little bit. And this isn't going to be an introduction to MATLAB. It's not going to be something where you have to know how to use MATLAB. We're just going to use it as a nice example, as something that takes some time and is easily parallelized. So we are going to go ahead and CD into our MATLAB directory and hit enter. If we look in here, we can see we have our invert random MATLAB scrap, our script. We can also see we have two submit files of parallel.slurm and serial.slurm. If we go ahead and take a look in our serial slurm file using uh, nano, so nano serial.slurm and hit enter, we can see our uh, different parameters here. So we have our shebang, basically telling Slurm this is the uh, shell or scripting language we're using. We are requesting one computer or one node, one core on that one node for zero hours, 10 minutes, and 10 seconds. We are asking for 10 gigabytes of memory per CPU, or sorry, per core. We have one uh, core, so one times 10 is 10. We are gonna call this invert rand. Our job error is gonna go to serial.jobid.err. Uh, and our output's gonna go into a similar file. And once again, this is just a short notation to say job ID that Slurm knows how to interpret. We are going to load our MATLAB software here. And then we're going to create a temporary working directory. And then we are going to execute the MATLAB code itself. Uh, if we go ahead and exit out of Nano with Control X, we can take another look into the invert RAND uh, script itself. So the actual MATLAB script. So invert RAND.m. This is basically just going to take a matrix of a certain size that we specify in that uh, submit script. I think it was 10 to the power of four. And it's going to make a matrix out of that and then invert it, which is a very computational heavy task. 
Again, this is not a MATLAB tutorial or an introduction to MATLAB. You, we don't need to see how exactly this works, but this is what we'll be executing today. If we go ahead and hit Control X again to exit out of that, what we can do to submit our first job is type in sbatch. This is the command to tell Slurm to go ahead and ex or submit a job. And we want to give it the instructions in serial.slurm and then hit enter. We have down to here submitted batch job 36791281. If we do sq dash u and then your username, you can take a look at what's happening. We can see that that same job is currently here on the batch partition called invert rand. It's truncated some of that off. We have our username. We're currently running. It was running for 11 seconds on one node. It's running on this specific computer itself. If we go ahead and run this again, we can see it's still running. Typically this job will take about two to five minutes to run. Uh, just as a quick check to make sure everyone could submit the job successfully, go ahead and take your job ID and the node list or reason and post it into chat for us. Again, to get that, you will do sq dash u or username and hit enter. And I'd like you to go ahead and post your job ID here and the node list or the reason as well with that. Okay, so it looks like we have a variety of different computers, some of us running on the same one, some of us running on different ones. You can also view a job by its uh, ID itself or the cube value of it. So if I'm going to take this one out of chat, now let's go ahead and take this one and do sq dash j and then the job id itself we can see that we have a r job running by a user on node c0408 we can go ahead and hit do sq dash u our username again just to check on the progress we're at about two and a half minutes now this is also going to be a great time to explain why we specify dash u or dash j with sq if we type sq with no other arguments and hit enter it's this very long list of different files or sorry different jobs we can see priority as a issue for this job uh, resources is another one or begin time now uh, if we scroll through we can see some are requesting multiple nodes it's a very long queue so if we go ahead and come here what we can also do just see the scale of this as well is practicing something from yesterday. If we pipe the output of SQ into word count with the line argument and hit enter, we can see that there is 2,300 jobs currently in queue, either running or pending to be ran. So again, it's very beneficial to specify your user or job ID itself. If we hit up arrow a few times to go back to our user and hit enter, we can see that our job has completed. If your job has completed, go ahead and throw a quick green check mark in the chat box for us. So you should only see this little header here. You shouldn't see your job ID anymore. If your job is still running, uh, go ahead and give me a red X.
Okay, so we'll go ahead and wait about another minute to let some jobs finish up here. So it looks like this is one of the ones still running. So if we do SQ dash J, so it looks like that job has now finished. So if we go ahead and want to take a look at our results, what we can do is type LS just to see where everything's at. And we can see that we have two new files here. We have serial.jobid.error and serial.rjobid.out. Let's go ahead and double check that we don't have any errors with this job. So if we type cat serial.36, I'm going to go ahead and just push tab to finish that out for us. Dot ERR. No errors is always a good sign, pretty much. If we go ahead and get our output by changing ERR to out, we can see that our job was completed in about 95 seconds. Or the actual inversion of the matrix took 95 seconds. Our job took a little bit longer. Go ahead and write down this number in your output file for us. So just on a little sticky note or a notepad document, just record that for us. We're going to play with that later. What we can also do is look at some details about our job using S account. So if we type S account dash J and then our job ID and hit enter, we can see our invert random job on partition from the demo group completed with no errors. If we type in another command that is basically a reformatting of job history or of S account, we can do job underscore history and then the job ID. We can see it requested one CPU for 10 minutes with 10 gigabytes of memory requested. It waited in queue for two seconds and took two minutes and 41 seconds to complete. We also used 2.8 gigabytes of memory. So if we were trying to optimize our submit script, we could probably reduce this down to say four gigabytes of memory and get it in even faster into the queue. What else we can also do is tweak S, our S account a little bit and say dash O. And basically dash O is a way to say, change the output format. We can say job ID, job name, and then let's say just elapsed, which is when it was, how long it took. Then let's go with submit for the submit time and then the start for start time and then enter. What we can see here is our job took two minutes and 41 seconds. It started today at 11.09 central, or sorry, was submitted at 11.09 central and then was submitted two seconds later. What we are gonna go ahead and do now is practice with some parallelization. So we are going to copy our serial file here. So copy serial.slurm. And then let's call it matlab for core.slurm and hit enter. If we go ahead and edit our new uh, slurm file, so nano matlab for core.slurm. What we are going to do is we're going to change our number of cores from one core to four cores. And to do that, we are going to go down to the end task per node line and replace the one with a four. Hit control X and Y and enter to save it. And then we are going to go ahead and submit our job using sbatch lab four core dot slurm. And hit enter. If we type sq dash u, our username again, we can see that our my job is still pending for priority reasons. Your job may have already started. When your job has started, so when it actually shows running like this, 
go ahead and once again post that job ID into chat as well as the node list or what node it's running on. This should, in theory, take a lot less time than our one core. Uh, we will see how much that goes here in a second. So it looks like we had someone request four different nodes there. Okay, so let's actually take a look at that. So sq-j, and it looks like the job either didn't start or failed. So let's go ahead and take a look at this while we have some jobs run. We're gonna change the sq to s account dash j in that job ID. And it looks like it already finished. So that was a very fast. So let's go ahead and go up and do sq-u, our username, and hit enter. And we can see that even my job has finished. If you've submitted your job and it's finished already, go ahead and put a green check up for us. If it's still running, go ahead and throw up the red X. Okay, so we still have a job running here. Something else you can do is, actually, let's go ahead and do this. So this is just going to be to create an example here. So I'm gonna create a quick uh, loop to submit 10 jobs. Actually, let's do five. Or six, I guess. Dispatch serial dot slow. So a quick for loop just to submit the same job six times. Let's say you don't want to constantly have to do sq dash u demo or sq your username and constantly check it. Something you can do is use a command called watch. So w a t c h, and then you can add sq dash u and your username after that. And what it will do by default is every two seconds, it will rerun that SQ command. So this way you can kind of watch in live time of what's happening. Uh, this is just an option you can use. I'm gonna go ahead and push Control C to exit. And because I don't want these jobs to run anymore, I'm going to type S cancel, that's you, and my username to get rid of those jobs. If we type ls, we can see that I have a lot of extra output files because of doing that. So I'm gonna scroll up here real quick and grab my job ID. If we go ahead and type serial, or sorry, not serial, cat serial dot our job ID dot out, we should have a much lower value for how long the inversion took. So what I'd like everyone to go ahead and do here is take the original value that you had earlier, so that about 90 seconds, and then paste that and then your new value into chat. So for example, I had about 95.431 seconds, and my new one took 18.0431. So go ahead and post that in the chat and we can kind of look at that speed up and see who had the fastest job runtime. We'll see if we have a new record here. Uh, to get out of watch, you push control and C. Okay, so it looks like we are down to 16 and three quarters of a second. 
Does anyone have a faster time than that? Okay, 27 seconds. So that took a little bit longer than a few. Mine aired out. I think I altered the wrong number in this SERM file. Yep. And so we'll actually talk about that in a bit about handling errors and talking about getting help. Uh, that will be down the line. So something else that we also have is not everything you can easily do or is convenient to do through a bash script. So let's go ahead and practice doing some interactive jobs. So what we are going to do is we're going to call s run. So s run, we need to tell it what resources we would like. So if we do dash dash, and, or let's just request cores today. So n tasks is equal to one. Let's do dash dash mem is equal to, let's call four gigabytes. So 4G, dash dash pty and bash. And if we hit enter, we can see that we now have an interactive job running. And so we have our job ID, queued and waiting for resources, has been allocated resources. And so if we look on our little left side here, we can see my username at login.crane and our folder. If we look now, we have our username at c 40 or a different one for y'all.crane. And so we can now see that we're on a worker node with an active terminal. So what we can go ahead and go do is if we do cd dot dot to go back to our job examples and type ls, let's go ahead and type in, and let's go ahead and go to Python. So cd Python and type ls again. We can now look at us having just a hello world Python script. Hello world. Where basically just sits there, imports time, does a for loop for five things, sleeps, prints out basically how many minutes have elapsed and moves on with life. What we can do is we can just type in Python and then hello world.py and hit enter. Actually, let's go ahead and control C that to stop it. Hello, hello world. Let's go ahead and just get rid of sleep by adding a uh, pound symbol in front of the time. Control X, Y, and enter. If we re-execute Python, even though it says minutes have elapsed, we just took out the delay so we can see that's process. We still have an active session here. We can type ls. We can still type sq. SQ dash u the username hit enter. We can see our current job is running or what our interactive job is doing. Something to note is that if you're say at the UNL City Campus Union and you're having lunch and you're running an interactive job and you close your laptop to go to class or to go to a meeting and you lose connection to edgy room or whatever wi-fi network you're connected to your uh, interactive job is going to be killed just because you're no longer connected that's just something to take note of to avoid issues uh, before we kind of move on and start wrapping up a little bit are there any questions or concerns and this can be about anything we've talked about so far So I'm going to CD to, actually, I don't need to CD on this terminal. So I'm going to switch back to my terminal one here. I am currently in my MATLAB job on terminal one or in my MATLAB folder. I am going to go ahead and submit a job over to the cluster here real quick. And let me go ahead and get my mouse working here. It's 
Hopefully we won't run out of charge today. <laughs> So s batch serial dot slurm. Oh, spelling mistake. S batch serial dot slurm. Submit. Let's go ahead and find out what if it's running yet. So sq dash j and enter. So it's currently running on C1501. So if I go over to terminal two here. I can create an interactive job on that same node by doing s run dash j in the job ID dash dash pty dash and hit enter. Again, spelling is very important. And I guess dash j is not an option anymore. Uh, but what we can do, let me go ahead and do sq dash u. So C1501 is our node. If we do S run dash dash node list is equal to the node dash dash PTY dash and hit enter. This will only work if there is a free spot on the node. Uh, it looks like that node may be fully used right now. So let's go ahead and actually close that. If I come up to terminal one again, I'm going to resubmit another job. Go ahead and pull up the queue for my user. And let's see what job or uh, job, but what node it's on. Okay, it's on 1502. So let's go ahead and go to terminal two. Change our 1501 to a 1502 and hit enter. And there we go. The job has started. So if I type in top, which is a great basic utility to view what's going on. And then if I type you and my username, it will sort it to every process that is currently being used by my user. So the way that, in just a quick basic way of how percentage CP works with Linux is it's how much of the how much of a one processor it's using so it, with one core on our original script it's using 97 percent of that so this is on a very well or not very well paralyzed but it's a job that's working very well to use that core as most uh, let's say if we requested four cores and it used all four cores 100 percent we would see 400% here instead or very close to it. Uh, so this is kind of a basic way to profile it. If I hit control C to exit, we can also do, oh boy, I don't remember that. Uh, we can do cat slash C group, or I guess that's not an option anymore as well. Uh, but that's kind of a basic way uh, are there any other questions? Otherwise, we'll kind of finish up for the day and work on some things. Uh, if you have a question, just throw up a red X and feel free to unmute your mic. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and move on to the last little thing we have for today. I'm gonna reshare my PowerPoint here. So some workflow tips, uh, we've kind of talked about this throughout the session. Uh, thank you for that uh, thing about priority through acknowledging. So yeah, if you acknowledge HCC in any of your publications that use HCC resources, uh, you'll get basically a little bit of priority credit for that. Uh, but talk about workflow tips. We've talked about that throughout the session, basically, use say some tutorial data or a very small section of your data to kind of make sure things will work. Uh, test the workflow in chunks. Uh, if you're developing the workflow, still run the commands in interactive job, just kind of play around with things. Always check both the error and output files. Uh, these provide some great information about what's happening or what went wrong. 
Some software, unfortunately, will output everything to the error file or the output file. Um, as we talked about with profiling both memory and CPU, you can check what resources were actually used using either S account or the job history command to get you some ideas of what's happening. Uh, we also have some more details on how to monitor jobs and our documentation here. And then finally, the big question of what happens if something goes wrong or I get stuck using Crane or Rhino or some other resource. Uh, for applications, uh, a great place to start is reading the documentation. So maybe a Git repository or a web page or a paper manual if those are still around. There's also the man command for things like ls or dash dash help with things like sbatch or Python. Uh, Google's a very great resource. Uh, if you're trying to do something with code or with an application, Google has great resources for that. If you are having an error, chances are someone else has had that error unless you're unfortunate enough to only get two results. Uh, commonly when we get questions, we oftentimes Google the same errors to figure out what's happening or get some more context. Looking in those error logs or other logs produced by your job is also a great place to look. You may have a job that it says it had no errors, but it's not running correctly, but it throws its own logs into a logs folder somewhere. Uh, those often give some key insights to maybe a input file isn't working. And then finally, if you don't have any other questions or if you have an issue that's probably easier communicated directly, uh, feel free to drop into our remote office hours every Tuesday to Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. That's gonna be over Zoom. Uh, you can also schedule another remote session if that time doesn't work for you by emailing our support email. Or if you'd like, you can also email our support email. Uh, we prefer that a little more just that way. We kind of have some time to look at your issue and dig up some details rather than being more on the spot. But either way, it's perfectly acceptable.